Nikita Khrushchev has been Stalin's loyal enforcer for the last decade, his signature on countless death warrants. Now he's a commissar tasked with keeping Red Army generals in line. But what does that actually mean? And are commissars like Khrushchev responsible for the Red Army's near collapse in 1941? I'm Spartacus Olson. Welcome to a World War II in real time bio special looking at Nikita Khrushchev and the position of the commissar. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev was born into peasant poverty in 1894 in what is now Kursk Oblast. He cuts his teeth leading striking mine workers in Ukraine's Donbass during the Great War. Then he leads a local Soviet in the heady days after the February Revolution. The Bolsheviks take power in the October Revolution and not long afterwards make peace with the Central Powers in March 1918. Donbass becomes part of the German Reich and Khrushchev flees to the east. In early 1919, he becomes a commissar to a Red Army construction battalion. The the commissar system is hardly a year old, created in April 1918 as Russia descends into civil war. That previous month, about 50,000 former Tsarist officers, including several hundred generals, are inducted into the Red Army as military specialists. Lenin declares, We must keep vigilant watch over them, putting commissars around them and counteracting their counter-revolutionary plans. The Commissars now co-sign any order and have the power to countermand army officers, even arrest or shoot them. Khrushchev's job is a different one, though, the political education of Red Army conscripts. He is to ensure his men receive their political indoctrination and learn basic skills such as reading and writing, but he is also charged with preventing defections. Khrushchev is demobilized in 1921, and the commissar system's future is uncertain as the civil war comes to an end. In 1924, the Central Committee establishes unity of command. The military commanders now have full authority over combat, supply, and administration, while commissars are put in charge of political instruction and troop morale. Meanwhile, Nikita Khrushchev is rising through the ranks of the Communist Party of Ukraine. By 1928, he is head of the party's organization department in Kyiv. He is transferred to Moscow in 1929, where he quickly ingratiates himself with Stalin. By March 1935, he has risen to first secretary of the Moscow Regional Committee, the highest authority in Moscow Oblast just in time to aid Stalin's Great Purge. From 1936 to 1938, Khrushchev oversees Stalin's hunt for supposed Trotskyite traitors. He signs off on the arrest of party officials, including former friends and acquaintances. Of the 28 top officials of Moscow City and Oblast, only three survived the purge. On June 27, 1937, to fill Stalin's imposed kill quota for Moscow, Khrushchev personally recommends that 2,000 former kulaks, landowning peasants, now living in Moscow, are to be liquidated. We've got a Between Two Wars episode which covers this period in more detail. Link is in the description. In his continued effort to rule by division, Stalin wants to reinforce party control over the army, and dual command with equality between military and political officers is reintroduced in August 1937. The commissars are now under the control of the political administration of the Red Army, headed by Lev Mechlis. But Khrushchev's path for now is another one. In January 1938, crowned with the laurels of having dutifully and loyally aided Stalin's purge, he succeeds Lazar Kaganovich as first secretary of the Ukrainian party. Here, he continues the bloodletting. Most of the Politburo is purged, as are many provincial deputies and Red Army commanders. When the USSR allies with Nazi Germany to split Eastern Europe after the dual invasion of Poland in September 1939, significant territories previously in Eastern Poland are added to his Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Khrushchev now becomes an important cogwheel in the machine to destroy Polish intellectual and religious networks, purge capitalists, and any remnants of the Polish armed forces and police. By 
1941, somewhere in the region of 1.2 to 1.5 million Poles will have been deported to Kazakhstan and Siberia, and tens of thousands outright murdered. Then, when Germany breaks the alliance and invades on June 22, 1941, Khrushchev returns to the role of commissar. Well, almost. He becomes a deputy commander for political affairs subordinate to a professional military officer. You see, the disaster during the Finnish war from November 1939 to March 1940 motivated the Politburo to reintroduce unity of command in August 1940. So Khrushchev now sits on the military council of the Southwestern Front as a major general under Colonel General Mikhail Kirponos. But after less than a month, in yet another 180 degree turn, the commissar system is reintroduced with full powers on July 16th. It's motivated by the failures of the Red Army to hold back the German invasion. This reassertion of party control is accompanied by scores of arrests and executions of generals. In Ukraine, Khrushchev's authority is now equal to that of Kirponos, whose orders cannot be enacted without Khrushchev's signature. At lower levels, down to the platoon, the concept is essentially the same. But the lower commissars are known as a politruk, or political leadership officer. These are the fanatical communist officials that supposedly force unwilling soldiers forward at gunpoint into suicidal attacks. It's a bit of a misconception, or at least an exaggeration, that grows out of the German concept of Weltanschauungskrieg, or Battle of Ideologies. Hitler's Commissar Order of June 6, 1941 declares commissars to be enforcers of the supposed Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy and sanctions their summary execution. The truth is more complex. Yes, the commissars do have the authority to deploy violence against their men, and yes, they do do that. But German General Erhard Raus, commanding 6th Panzer Division, will warn against the simplistic view after the war. The example set by commissars is largely responsible for the tenacious resistance of the Russian soldier, even in hopeless situations. It is not wholly true that the German commissar order was solely responsible for inciting the commissars to bitter last-ditch resistance. The impetus much rather was fanaticism together with soldierly qualities and probably also the feeling of responsibility for the victory of the Soviet Union. He goes on to recount numerous instances in which commissars lead their men from the front and die alongside them after fighting to the last bullet. Moreover, battle is just one aspect of commissars or politrucks' responsibility. The greater part of their time is spent on political indoctrination and morale. It's a massive system. At the outbreak of war, the Red Army has 26,500 Lenin corners, small shrine-like displays with buildings which feature portraits of Lenin, posters, and propaganda materials. There are around 2,000 army clubs and 267 Red Army houses. These are leisure institutions which carry an extensive library of an estimated 25 million books. Units at the front are distributed booklets and pamphlets and are accompanied by mobile libraries. As the Southwestern Front fights the Battle of Kiev, we see the two faces of the Commissar. Contrary to the image of a leader from behind, feared and disrespected by the forces, Khrushchev seems to have been well respected by his Red Army colleagues. Part of his role is to liaise between the front and the decision makers in Moscow, performing essential work like acquiring more men or resources. That said, there are other commissars who live up to the stereotype, like Major General Nikolai Vashugin. On June 27th, he drives to the headquarters of the 8th Mechanized Corps and berates the Corps Commander, Lieutenant General Ryabyshev. Ryabyshev's men are exhausted and near broken after two days of fierce fighting. They have been ordered to attack again, but are unable to do so. Vashugin marches up to Ryabyshev, addressing the general as Judas. Vashugin screams, The field tribunal will listen to you, traitor. Here under the pine trees we will listen to you, and under the pines we will shoot you. Predictably, the attack that Vashugin forces is a bloody failure. 
Khrushchev's job is no dance on roses either. Stalin has ordered Kiev held at all costs to prevent the Germans crossing the Dnieper, and by August 22nd, the city is surrounded. It is not until the 17th that Stalin gives the order to withdraw, too late for any chance to save the trapped forces. By September 26th, the Germans have captured 665,000 prisoners, and Kirponos has been killed in action. Khrushchev escapes by airplane. Now, there's a bit of a dispute over where the blame lies. Khrushchev will later claim that he and Kriponos had suggested to Stalin that they should attempt a breakout and that this was rejected. Zhukov will later claim that all of that is nonsense and that Khrushchev was the one who convinced Stalin that the city could be held. It's all bound up in post-war politics. We won't go into it here, but Khrushchev will have every reason to make Stalin look incompetent, and Zhukov will likewise have a falling out with Khrushchev. Nonetheless, disasters like Kiev demonstrate the danger of political influence over the military. And there are more to come. Lev Mechlis, head of the entire commissar system, disgraces himself in Crimea in early May 1942, when Stalin holds him directly responsible for the loss of the Kiev Peninsula. Total losses are almost 600,000, and the door is open for an Axis strike at the Caucasus oil fields. Later that month, it is Khrushchev's turn to bear responsibility. He's a major driving force behind an offensive to liberate Kharkov. The plan is hugely overambitious and opposed by the heads of the Red Army, Shaposhnikov, Zhukov, and Vasilevsky. They are soon proven right. Shortly after the offensive is launched on May 12th, it runs into a massive buildup of enemy troops. After an effective German counterattack, around 230,000 Soviet troops are lost. Later that summer, Stalin humiliates Khrushchev in the presence of several senior army commanders. He empties his pipe onto Khrushchev's bald head, claiming, When our Roman commander lost a battle, he lit a bonfire, sat down in front of it, and poured ashes on his own head. In those days, that was considered the greatest disgrace a commander could endure. Defeats like these inspire men like Zhukov and Vasilevsky to push for the separation of the military and political. As Stalin matures as a supreme commander, he acquiesces. He relinquishes his previously overbearing control over strategic matters and decides that the counteroffenses of the coming autumn and winter are for the professionals to plan. The final stage in this reform is the abolition of the position of Commissar on October 9, 1942. The decree issued by the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet on the 9th reflects Stalin's new faith in the Red Army. The system of war commissars was based on mistrust of the military commands. The present patriotic war against the German invaders has welded our commands together and produced a large core of talented new commanders who have gathered experience and who will remain true to their honor as officers to the death. Red Army commanders now have full authority again. This doesn't mean that political officers go away altogether. Khrushchev has been posted to the Stalingrad front and is again a deputy commander for political affairs, a Zampolit. Zampolits maintain a supervisory role, reporting judgments and concerns to Moscow. Many are well-connected, powerful party figures. The risk of denunciation from a man like Khrushchev shouldn't be taken lightly. Khrushchev's role at Stalingrad is limited, although he will later inflate it. He reports back to Moscow and is consulted before Stalin replaces General Yeryomenko with General Chuikov. Khrushchev's contribution to the success at Stalingrad in February 1943 raises his stock with Stalin and he is promoted to lieutenant general. He will then serve at the Voronezh front and by July 1943 he will be back where it all began, Kursk Oblast. So, is the abolition of the commissar system the reason why the Red Army has turned things around? Well, it's hard to say that this is the single decisive factor. Ultimately, the commissars and their military failures are a symptom of Joseph Stalin's destructive obsession with personal control over the arms of the Soviet state. But what Nikita Khrushchev does show is that the system isn't black and white. He had a productive relationship with the professionals he worked with, yet he was also responsible for the disaster at Kharkov. Stalin will never let him forget about Kharkov. 
But it's Khrushchev who will have the last laugh. He is a willing and loyal executioner for the Stalinist system. But he will condemn it after Stalin's death when he rises to the leadership of the USSR. Supposedly, a big factor in this change of heart is Stalin's unnecessary sacrifice of men at Kiev. Whether that change is genuine or yet again the result of cold, hard politics, I'll leave up to you. If you'd like to find out more about the men who carried out the Great Purge, you can click right here for a special I made about the NKVD. If we want to avoid the terrors inflicted on humanity by these autocratic systems, it is essential that we understand them. That is our mission here at Time Ghost, to learn from our past failures and successes so that we can all work towards a better future based on democracy and respect for universal human rights. It is only thanks to the Time Ghost Army that we can do that. So join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Never forget.